Hello everyone, today we talk about the social background of the Hussite Wars, about which we made several videos both from a strictly military, but also in fact, also a more political uh, point of view. So, you know, essentially the, the broader context, uh, briefly, at the beginning of the 15th century, uh, the king and the nobility of Bohemia, just like in basically in all countries at the time, were in competition to fulfill what each saw as the interest of, of the kingdom, thus fundamentally their own, um, and the obvious push from the monarchic side was towards centralization, and it's against this that the nobility in, in 405 had halted uh, the, the, the same sovereign Venceslas the fort right, and uh, largely control the, the country's government instead. And this is the same context, naturally, in which the, um, say, the, the instances of church reform and broader, you know, mm, reviews, let's say, of the uh, religious life were carried out by the, the Hussites, right, the, the movement uh, born um, already, let's say, as you know, part of course previous spiritual paths, but uh, led at a point by Jan Hus, right, whose followers were essentially striving to include all social groups within the political community, right? There was a great interest in representation, as we will see today, essentially there was an important crisis in Bohemia, even before the, the disaster actually that the Hussite wars brought uh, to a much larger scale to the country, um, and uh, a, a great role, however, in this push for, let's say, a, a regime change and a, a different worldview did come from the commoners, right? At least these were always under some other guide, right? Some no noblemen participated, of course, uh, in the Hussite movement, even though the, the top ones were somehow more interested uh, com understandably in being co-opted by the system as they already were right and they would essentially maintain in part uh, that kind of power by a lot of newly enriched and somehow morally even worse individuals came to, to share much greater power than before while the um, uh, at the end uh, of the, the Hussite uh, wars the, it's the people that of course had part essentially caused this and had dramatically worsened their living conditions, as it basically happens in all, in all revolutions. Um, yet, of course, there is uh, an interesting element in all this. We will see better maybe some other time regarding the understanding of the Christian faith and of the laws of God, um, a bit at all levels of the Bohemian community, right? So um, this, uh, rather than just you know, the, the contributing to what we call as the Hussite movement, actually mirrored um, the development of a sort of common, uh, if we can say even national faith, right? Mostly based on Czech as, uh, you know, the, the dominating culture and language of the Bohemian crown. Uh, but that was, in this sense, uh, understood in a more, of course, political and in part civil way. Universal tradition, however, managed to prevail on these uh, on these forms that were fundamentally inadequate for for the time being. So not that eventually the Hussite exiles wouldn't have an impact even in the fur, uh, further ref reformation and so on, but that can hardly be seen as a positive endeavor for that matter. In any, in, any in any case, they lost, and they lost because their own the the the, the, the Bohemian. I, I say Bohemian by of course indicating the crown, right? So of course, as we will see now, and as we have already discussed, um, the crown included different countries, different peoples, uh, subjects also with different religions. Um, but um, what we can see indeed is that the nobility by 434 had defeated the radicals, 
right? There had been also broader negotiation, not all the host sides were, uh, say, expelled or repressed, but surely the price paid by the people in the country was, was enormous, right? But in the 14th century, especially at the time of Charles IV, Bohemia, Prague specifically, had been the heart of Europe in many ways, um, not just as the imperial scene in that, in that moment of Luxembourg um, in Germany, but also a major cultural center that had received important classical influxes, even from, you know, that, that's why the emperor was so, so connected with Italy in his expedition, multiple expeditions there. Um, it, this is a moment of, re of cultural reform. Uh, this is the moment in which um, Rienzi and uh, Petrarch are in Prague. There is a, a truly European culture developing from the, the literal, you know, uh, geographical heart of Europe that Bohemia also quite uh, neatly um, represents. Um, and when we look at the end of the Hussite Wars, we see instead a, a devastated country, a dramatically impoverished one, one that had lost one third of its population, by the way, right? Um, not just for the war entirely, as we will see now, but still. And those same calls for popular sovereignty that had uh, embodied somehow the most promising um, you know, uh, instance were. Um, were su suppressed fundamentally, and so a worse social condition had been accomplished overall. So looking at this today, right, so that we can see, say, politics in another video, this time we look at society, and surely we'll, there is plenty of uh, warfare. We already made a couple of videos about, mm, you know, who side wars, battles, uh, and we will keep making them. So as we were saying just before, the Bohemian crown included, of course, Bohemia, that was essentially the richest um, and most somehow, you know, connected, civilized uh, country with, with Prague, um, and as it historically had been the sea of the, the Bohemian kings and so on. Then the, the most important chunk after it was Moravia, for sure, in, in, the, in the south, then Silesia in the east, as the... Bohemians and the Poles have fundamentally shared this area. I made a video about um, medieval Silesia that you can look at uh, to, to understand better but the, the details. Then in the north you had upper and lower Lusatia. Thus uh, Bohemia was just one of five provinces united under the crown of St. Venceslas, the national saint of, of, of Bohemia. And, and not all, right? Uh, popular internationally for especially in Central Europe being quite connected to local um, you know traditional identities so the the population of the Bohemian crown consisted fundamentally of a mixture of Czechs that were majority the Germans Poles Lusatian Serbs and Jews um, they, as you understand, they mostly were distributed according to different patterns. The Czechs formed basically the, the, the crown's heartland. Then the Germans were importantly mixing within, but they mostly occupied the, the outer areas, the Poles in the east, the, the Serbs in the north, and the Jews as part of a you know, more scattered population, especially in the urban centers. And Bohemia has uh, an important history of, in fact, state building from the monarchic side, also carried out through the, through the Jewish uh, officials. We um, can talk about it in, in another... This is a bit tip typical uh, in Central Europe. Um, so, in Bohemia, at the beginning of the 15th century, albeit the imperial court was... Um, the, the, the royal court was, uh, essentially speaking, either French or German, the Czech language was the dominating one, right? So the noble courts of the country, town councils, uh, used Czech to record business. The Bohemian Chronicles, importantly, already used vernacular next to Latin. And, of course, the religious, mm, the, the preaching, let's say, also the spread of the, the new uh, spiritual mm, let's say, uh, 
was spoken and written in Czech, large, not not entirely, as you understand, but as essentially the most important vernacular spoken by the, the majority of the people. Thus, um, albeit the Hussite words cannot be read in a sense like Czechs versus Germans and so on, which is something that, of course, derives from the fact that Central, I made several days about this topic, the Central European monarchies were essentially elective, and so the local nobility began to fuel this idea of a sort of local, uh, say, native national character opposed to the mostly foreign dynasties and all their protégés, their retinues, their officials that came, very often also for, from more developed countries. Again, think about the Luxembourgs that were essentially French um, and uh, that had made Prague, as we've seen, the imperial capital and so on. So there was always a negotiation and cooperation with this, but, say, stressing the national divide, um, which wasn't so clear especially as far as the, the common people were concerned in terms of ethnicities. Germans had mi been migrating, uh, also, say, in the lands in, for, from lots of centuries. And generally speaking, it's also difficult in Central Europe, um, especially in this kind of frontier area bet between the, the, the Germans and the Slavs, to say, vous, vous. But it was, a, 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 um, say, a political way to to say, okay, we are the establishment, and then there is an, a broad international game that we want to have more leverage on. Nothing to do with the 19th, 19th and 20th century ethno-nationalistic categorism and discrimination. It was a, actually Bohemia at that, that point displayed as this areas would, in fact, uh, until, until the nation state of the contemporary era maintained a, a peaceful coexistence between the various ethnicities fundamentally and the difference was political more or social sometimes indeed right as we will see now there were german dominated sectors that the the uh, kings had somehow supported more to, to to counterbalance the instances of other powers around this, this were the means at disposal of uh, by the various uh, medieval kings to, to centralize further same goes for the jews and so on and um, the, um, uh, the the idea that this, the new mm, religious ferment for reform, if not a revolution, uh, uh, being based on sort of national consciousness and among the common people um, as a single, uh, say, subject, right? Of, of the crown, what was being consolidated at this point. I made a video last year that is about the end of universalism and then the rise of, say, the national monarchies as such. So we are more or less in that moment of disgregation of universal uh, powers and tradition. Um, so, as we were saying before, at the beginning of the 15th century, most Germans lived in the border regions, as they had historically been doing. Um, some also in the interior towns, such as the very important mine one uh, of Kutnaora, that is also here a pattern in Central Europe. You can see, I don't know, in countries like Transylvania and etc. that. Uh, Saxon colonization of sort, uh, we've seen it in Silesia quite importantly, um, uh, to so speaking of closer lands uh, that um, had been possible, let's say, because you know the, the German colonists compared to the Slavic populated area historically had been somehow crafted coming from probably a Western, a Frankish um, way of land management that again was much more uh, hierarchical and developed and and complex than the one that the, uh, the in fact the Islamic monarchies had developed from it was still much more tribal somehow uh, in nature so there were important infrastructures and especially centers of government uh, being importantly influenced by these this minorities uh, it's important to stress that, as we've seen 
uh, also in other videos about realities that have partially to do with this this is, this is true also i don't know for the the poles in ukraine etc that while the germans um were in important control of these uh, most important assets and so on these centers still the majority of the population was czech right and thus were, they were also generally speaking poorer than them in prague some crafts and trades did follow ethnic lines this was normal but in medieval europe also universities function like that usually there was the the guild of you know this nation this of the others even in the same place um however to be to be fair in the same capital of bohemia both the czechs and the germans were about equally represented for example in the most important textile trade that was also an international one so in, in many areas it was split, in some areas the Czechs prevailed, etc. The government in Old Town Prague, but it wouldn't bother um, until 1408 when it frustrated the efforts of, of Jan Hus and his friends to reform uh, the church. So that was again to say there, there is a broader political problem, but we will target you or approximate you in, in a sense just because you are German. And, uh, of course, the, the two things were intertwined, but still there are different elements within the same, essentially. So, when we look at Bohemian economy at this point, it was pretty much similar in the general lines to, to any other, right? We're talking about pre-industrial system, economic life was uh, subsistent in, in, in character, fundamentally. Uh, Bohemia had been importantly spared by the worst effects of the Black Death in the mid 14th century. There were some areas of Europe, in fact, including, say, where the where plague had arrived, but especially towards the northeast, had not been so strong. Right, so certain cities like Krakow, in part, even the same Prague, had been somehow spared, uh, which was somehow um, rare, at least for the most. Uh, the, the hardest hits, right? So this had produced also internationally considering how uh, impacting the demographically the, the plague had been somehow important for consolidating in Bohemia, in, in Poland, that in fact uh, during the, the 14th century somewhat concentrate power, consolidate power, um, a strengthening of the, the institutions, right? Especially of the monarchy. Uh, however, some destructive waves of black death would hit Bohemia later, like in 1380, 1395, between 1413 and 15, right? So this still did follow the, the general trend of population declines in, in, in the rest of Europe for, for the country, especially between the 80s and the 20s, respectively of the 14th and the 15th century. And as in the rest of Europe, the most affected negatively by this population decline had been the peasants because the agricultural products um, costs did not rise at, at the same uh, rate of labor right so this brought to a drop in consumption affecting the, the peasantry especially but also commerce in artisanal production and this began essentially to bog down the system so as you understand paving the way to revolution is often this kind of imbalances and remember that in the middle ages the system was ever more delicate so sometimes we don't even have the the actual absolute quantities of how certain phenomena impacted or not but again a central european mm, country with you know, being struck by such waves by, of, of plague is evidently a, a system that r um, on average receives an important mm, degree of political and social instability in the process. Um, naturally, it's not just the Black Death. It was mostly and all intertwined a matter of political instability. There were struggles for power within 
the same royal family, between the king and the church, the king and the nobility, right? So the most important establishment, because as we'll see now, also the church was quite, quite powerful, and as you know, would be targeted, uh, essentially, because that that's what the Hussite movement really got down to, right? Is stealing the church's uh, property, and and the whole thing naturally rendered the country less uh, profitable for investment, both uh, general, you know, uh, weariness and um, and frustration, desperation in some cases. There is also an important international dimension. As we've seen, Bohemia itself had been somehow the center of the empire, and the position of Wenceslas had in fact been carried out by the Germanic princes right in 1400 already before leaving um, you know the, the Bohemians doing doing the rest one of the most important consequences by the way had been that the imperial court had abandoned Prague already and so together with it all its very important patronage right so uh, entrepreneurs artisans had left uh, the city that doesn't matter how important however suffered um, an important uh, blow, right? Also in prestige, and uh, again, those were rough times. I made a video last uh, year that was t uh, titled "the the fate of the empire between the Luxembourgs and the and the Habsburgs." That talks a bit about this period, in fact, um, in the various game of the Central European crowns, uh, but Europe had been contracting, as we've seen importantly in the 14th century crisis uh, playlist, and this all impacted uh, Bohemia as well. Growth in the economy depended mainly on internal trade, because a uh, few Czech products were, were actually exported abroad, wasn't that kind of enormous uh, output or local production, whatever. Um, Prague and lesser towns such as Bilzhen produced cloth for domestic markets, mostly. It's true that Prague exported some arms and armor, right, and some hides um, left uh, Bilzhen for for abroad. This is this is true. This is normal. Of course, something was exported. However. Uh, there were also lots of imports that fortunately the Czech could afford because of their silver mined at Kutna Hora. The fact that, however, the, the economic situation was in Florid can be observed by monetary uh, debasement, right? The Prague Groschen uh, declined in the first two decades of the 15th century by 20%. Uh, by comparison with the currency of the neighboring Hungary, that didn't have, for example, as much as um, this more immediate infrastructurally or, um, ready mineral resources, precious metals like, like uh, Bohemia. Uh, and the debasement of the Hella, that is to say the coin which most uh, bohemian workers and peasants were paid by was even more rapidly depleted. So in terms of purchasing power the lower estates were sinking and they felt it also because they were in fact the most exposed ones that would be more directly affected and came closer to, to misery even by these changes that did are actually pretty high uh, even for today's standards, if you think about it, but in, in those times it meant also practically much worse than today. Uh, and, and this presented with, as we'll see now, considering the, the lifestyle, the, the quality of life in general, pretty strong political evidence, because the other estates were profiting from this as well. Um, in fact, uh, not even the establishment was fearing wealth, and as always, because the the system was everyone's, right? Uh, I remember once I, I, when I was a child, I asked m my father was checking, you know, market titles, uh, and I said, "That w which ones are we?" And he said, "You know, it, 
you know, we are there, everyone, right? You know, <laughs> if you things go bad, uh, this tends to be um, really collected. Uh, the institutions had to remain standing, right? And in the decades before the Hussite revolution, let's call it this way, the tax burdens on royal and ecclesiastical estates rose dramatically. In 1418 alone, the new town of Prague was asked seven times for tax contributions. So uh, this is important because, again, tax contributions, as you know, we've made several videos about medieval law, were to be negotiated, right? There had to be a, a good reason for which sovereign could ask them, because it was, aside from the tolls, these exactions were somehow extraordinary. I mean, I also the, the tolls were somehow negotiated um, and not continuous, but um, the, the idea still is that the, the sovereign was there not to get stuff from the subjects uh, without any um, specific negotiated purpose that would wouldn't be in fact accepted or had to be just uh, disconnected from the local community's interests right but in times of crisis of course uh, this is not just about the, uh, the the king or the church this is also about the entire let's say uh, ladder also let's say that that in a situation in which the same estates are getting internal, internally stratified on their own. And so uh, there are m many more intersections and political games being carried out there to trying to, to favor one side or the other. Um, the clergy with prebends were among the, wealth, the wealthiest people in the Bohemian crown. But there were also many poor priests. Hmm. So what we just said is pretty even. And I also made a video about the Utraquist priests. And of course, these were very different from the, you know, the archbishops say remained loyal to, uh, to the papacy, to, to, to the royal establishment and so on. At least the one that supported the, the, the repression of uh, the side community and before the revolution the church owned altogether in the crown land 28 percent of uh, of well right of, of the property uh, and prelates such as the canons of St. Vitus Cathedral Prague enjoyed an, an annual income of some 18 to 18,000 groschen, that is to say almost 50 a day, whereas the typical holder of a single altar, say parish church, um, essentially would earn one groschen uh, uh, a day, whereas the, the average skilled l laborer would earn two or three at most. So this gives you an idea of you know, the disproportion. But again, St. Vitus Cathedral was embodying the same, the same Bohemia in many ways. So um, we have to, to understand that w what can the, 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 the monarchy do in this case. They arrived to, to a point where, yes, they could earn a lot individually, but the rest of the populace was becoming so more uniformly poor that they started realizing that altogether the, the power ways was, was actually narrow in, in relative terms and they could usurp part of, of their their prerogatives as well. Hence the instances of representation and so on. Among the clergy only some four thousand of twenty thousand who sought ordination between thirteen ninety five and fourteen sixteen found uh, a parish or, or other living. This is why also there were so many, say, angry priests among the two sides that were so, um, you know, vehemently involved and also fought as in, in, in the Hussite army and, and so on, and boosting this 
kind of um, what was of course a Christian ideal but naturally bent to their own specific political and social instances and the clergy like in a typical Christian country uh, was present in many aspects of daily life there was a, a role of spiritual guidance but as we've seen important temporal lords were were prelates so these were men who owned land military retinues they were part of the of the feudal hierarchy and so on by the 14th century lay religious groups such as the Valdensians Valdens were active for example in southern Bohemia in Radetz uh, Kraloven in Prague and Zatetz and they would inspire further the Hussite cause you know the Valdensians had fundamentally been repressed by the by the papacy and had taken refuge in some peripheral areas of uh, say at the borders between Italy, France and Germany and I also made a video about 17th century Valdensian warfare um, that I will keep discussing at some point and so this instances of rebellism of course of the emarginated fringe uh, of caring heterodox ideology that fundamentally spreads eventually in areas uh, in um, that from which the, the establishment can be threatened is somehow typical it happens in any age in, in any way um, and uh, it, it's interesting to study the relation between the Valdensians and the Hussites because you realize in fact it was some sort of tradition also in the form of surely of some exoteric knowledge but also more practically in terms of uh, political and military activism organization and so on it's the same thing that the expelled Hussites as we were saying before would do in countries like Germany and since we're showing like because they had been also military they had veterans right so showing what these commoners could do which definitely in Hussite military history was was quite impressive um, however of course the country was largely ruled by the secular nobility but by the property the temporal power um, this had always been based in in a feudal country essentially on on the military skills and experience of the what were effectively knights right or at least men at arms that entailed to be such also the ownership of land and castles that could provide with the revenues to to achieve that level of training uh, li broader lifestyle because also politically speaking they were meant to to have a leading role in many ways um, and uh, the the equipment etc uh, so a power was traditionally exercised on the countryside on the population that worked for them in, in exchange for protection so in the typical order and um, nobles and the, the gentry because there were different levels of course exercised a right of patronage on something like three-fifths of the country's parish churches mm -hmm. and we've seen how powerful the church really um, fundamentally one-third of the Bohemian crown estates uh, were ecclesiastical. In the Ministeriales series we have described, often mostly in German history, but in this sense Bohemia was, was quite similar, how important this advocacy, let's say, on the, for, the, for the ecclesiastical land, because the, the prelates could not um, carry out higher justice, like criminal punishment, etc. So they always needed some armed wing that was, however, Properly, not just uh, you know it was not ecclesiastical as such was was part also of a different um, estate per se and so the nobility was of course powerful there were some also very powerful that rivaled with the same kings historically for example the Rosenbergs 
Rosenberg, the ancient Vitigolians who owned enormous domains uh, in Moravia. Uh, then there were the Schwambergs. Uh, you, you hear naturally the um, these are essentially the, 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 the Slavicization of, of Germanic names. And for such important dynasties, this had occurred because of the the rising importance, of course, in, in the in the Ger in the Holy Roman Empire and in, in uh, essentially German rule system. So what we've seen also with the Luxembourgs, and despite being French, fundamentally they were still working within the empire with with a Germanic um, uh, court, largely. And um, as a consequence, this the sort was but one of status. In fact, these houses wouldn't be particularly supportive, let's say, of the Hussite uh, movement, which was supposed to be re revolutionary, right, and was essentially undermining the same basis of of their own prerogatives uh, that instead they wanted to maintain to rule the country for, for what it was. Of course, they also contributed in that sense to that, to that national recompaction, but just as the traditional elite. Um, and um, there, there, was, um, there was a resistance by these major dynasties, for example, to urban expansion that had always been supported by the kings exactly to curb the most powerful nobility. Uh, and the same, in fact, royal expansion, for example, near Pelgen, there was, however, we'll talk about the cities later, also a concern from the side of, of, the, of the crown for the excessive uh, growth of certain uh, urban progress, especially outside the, the city walls. And the nobility of the Bohemian crown was, however, not really a, a solid estate. Right, and many noblemen would join the Hussite cause, especially uh, some baron, the, the baronial land owners. So, some, you know, the lower steps of the nobility ladder. But some of these individuals were also really powerful their own way. For example, Cheniak of Wartenberg, uh, Wartenberg actually, and who helped the Hussite movement. Uh, in in a crucial way between 1415 1419 right he would lead a uh, public protest against the the execution of Jan Hus council of constance and um also helping the Hussite clergy to organize and ordinate themselves All right so as we will see the nobility would provide as always the um the commoners this already happened in the previous century and basically in any other with m properly technical military expertise yet at the same time they were themselves caring about the spiritual aspects the broader cultural aspect of course you could not separate these um uh, estates as cases that are just you know programmed like bots to just okay I'm a knight to do war you're a priest to do uh, religion it was all one right so th these fields all overlapped below the nobility it was also gentry of some sort known as the Vladikove or Zamani uh, that had a, a considerable role in the Hussite world, because you know these were a bit the, the backbone of, um, like in Central Europe, we've seen it recently also for, for the Hungary, um, uh, feudal army organization that they were, meant properly to be to be noblemen, right? Because the distinction was somehow loser. This these countries had not been so intensively feudalized as we we're saying before, uh, like say the Western. Once, so that idea that still the the freeman there was a real freeman right that owned land and even some servant could be considered as the the properly a nobleman with an important series of 
prerogatives. And at the beginning of the 15th century were about 2,000 such families in Bohemia. They were split in two groups as well. An upper one known as the Riti Ri, right? So just like uh, like the Richer in, in Poland, but this all comes from Reiter. So the Militas, it was the Knights, right? Plus their Esquires, by the way, because they, as such, as Knights, they also had to, uh, to, to support a retinue of some sort. And then a, a lower group that were the Panosse, Panosse, I think, uh, that is like, uh, that are also known in Latin as Clientes Armigeri. So these are, again, people who engage in warfare, say Clientes stress the fact that they were part of somebody else's retinue in some way, but they were still kind of freemen, right? And so Armigeri, those who are armed, and also in some you know, heavier way, not just the, you know, the peasant with, with, uh, with the pitchfork. Um, while some of these gentry built small castles, mm -hmm. as it was in the feudal tradition, many of them at this point lived actually in simple farms, and they were difficultly distinguishable from their tenants hadn't it been for uh, properly the the documents that show how much land they owned or um, that properly registered their gentry condition we, we wouldn't be able to, to, to distinguish them in fact so clearly there have been studies carried out especially in the last years of the 14th and the first decade of the 15th century showing that uh, four-fifths of this gentry had rental incomes between the 120 and the 600 groschen. That is, um, they were paid by something like three or five peasant families at best. 600 groschen was for a gentleman uh, just a subs subsistence revenue, right? They thus needed to find other incomes that, as you understand, entailed uh, mercenarism and or practically robbery <laughs> as such, given that, again, the royal power and justice in general talking about 15th century Bohemia it's not that it's like today where there is a strong state uh, somehow uh, a, a uniform control uh, if you were just a local gentleman Bennett Arf, you, you had an important kind of control in the local populace in a mobster like fashion right and violence was pretty much out there and that's the reason, in part, why this meant, in part, we're, we're even up to, 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 to kind of a military status, because they, they lived out of it. This difference was increasingly felt in a time of crisis, because essentially the upper, say, the, the knights, as we've seen, were being co-opted by kings, uh, by the church, uh, also because there were individuals coming from the lower strat of, of the population it could be like new men that could uh, be more loyal in that more depending on this um, particular patronage than you know having a power on their own that could challenge the same establishment whereas the others turned also to this kind of violence fuel, fuel, fueled the the Hussite ranks right and also provided the movement with an important military component Importantly enough, this certification, which is typical of the lock of l the crisis of late medieval Europe, so you have essentially a, a crystallization, an oligarchy forming and being defined in the ancien regime as such, but at least temporarily in, the, in this age of revolution, the lower strata uh, began to develop also a sense of political identity, 
I mean, part would be maintained, you know, the, but because there was always the possibility of saying being up to a night level uh, by a certain degree, achieving that at some point in your life. But still, they were consistent, also from a demographic point of view, as we've seen, and um, they 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 felt they could fight for their representation as well. Um, during 1420 and 1434, uh, what you see in under the command of Jan Szyszka uh, and uh, all the success of the Hussite armies, well, is deriving in important part from, from these men, right? Um, as we have explained countless times, not that the Hussites were carrying out revolutionary tactics, uh, infantry being brought to a new level, they were using tactics that had always been used, they were just very pissed and morally loaded, and thus they they made things happen, but say historiography, especially the one stressing the the folly of the, the military revolution that never existed historically by any degree, especially in those centuries, exposed of more way more traditional fighters and fighting techniques, etc. than we usually think. Uh, and reflect on the fact that, of course, uh, the all, all the popular movements, military-wise, in the Middle Ages were somehow led by the, the military elite, not by the people, per se, right? Plus, when you look at these uh, essentially confessional clashes that begin, you can start seeing the 15th century as the beginning of the age of war, of, say, what we call as war of religion improperly, because all wars since ever... Um, since the dawn of religion were fought in, in the name of God in any people, in any country, in any millennium no difference of any single kind between paganism and, and theism but there is a very specific time let's say in European history in fact between the 15th and 17th century in which the confessional clash there takes the, the form of um, let's say of that same uni universal disgregation, as you understand, that makes in the individual thinking can find essentially a new path in its own. There are some radical ideas, but some are, you know, s some others are somehow based on um, on an important um, core belief, or also some conscience scrapple and so on. When you look at noblemen like Nicholas of Hus. So men who, after all, had their own worldly possessions, so for the time standards, they could consider themselves still somehow uh, fortunate. They could still f float uh, in the, within the establishment, but they would essentially endanger those because they truly believed, in this case, in the Hussite ideals. It is true that uh, this was an impoverished uh, family, um, Nicholas had had a successful career at that point as Burgrave in a castle belonging to the canons of the Visharat chapter. So he probably felt the the impo say the, the the imposition of that uh, delegate church delegate uh, administrator in, in some way, um, and in joining uh, the very radicals of the Hussite movement, he denied that entire uh, establishment right, prerogative. Um, and this also should be understood because, of course, I, I think that most people actually root for the radicals or the extremes, or at least they, the, the Hussites are mostly depicted as some sort of heroes, whatever, also because the Protestant mythology has wanted to make anyone who was trying to break free from Rome as some great heroic achievement. Actually, you know, the Hussite history is, is the history of one of the, the most systematically and traumatically brutal oppression, subjugation, killing, extermination, raping, and all the most de de depraved things you can imagine. Um, like, how things were mostly done at the time, this is true, but definitely destroying the possibility of having an order 
right, to make things truly work better, right? So there is a lot of, of uh, almost iconoclastic theory in that regard that you understand at some point. It's as if, you know, there was like a, a communist revolution nowadays and you look, ah, what, what heroes they were. Well, we, we managed to do that, we'll say, with, with the 19th century revolutionary movements that it's as if today, again, you supported, you know, communist terrorism. Um, but, um, of course, history is it's, it's very different. Um, but instead, I, in fact, root for that reason mostly for universal tradition. It's just people can't handle universal tradition from both sides mostly. But that's the most sane and obvious and intelligent thing to do. Uh, but it's also true in that sense that the standards of the establishment were not up to that universal order. So, again, nothing to cheer about what the Hussites did that essentially was to destroy their own country because Bohemia went back dramatically um, also to a style you, you see it uh, I was told also in, probably in art in again one third of the population wiped out by the wars by the, the, the epidemics I mean that's the, the great accomplishment of the great uh, you know the great heroes of the the, the Protestant cause um, the the mm, the actual point, and they they fell under the the Catholic Habsburgs Al anyway. So aside from the autonomy that eventually the Saint Protestant Bohemia achieved, right? That's still uh, the proof that this country sank further and lost the opportunity of having the degree of power that, after all, under the the Luxembourgs were contending from the Saint Habsburg. So that that's the scale of of Hussite failure. And, and probably of all these great, you know, com commoners instances that were crushed, fortunately, but, you know, stupidly for them, um, just like the Jacquerie, like the, the movements of the, the salaried workers in, in the Italian or Flemish textile industry. I mean, uh, for not talking about uh, the rebellion of Watt Tyler, John Bolton, and so on. So... Uh, this is an important proof of the properly the destructive effect of that kind of process because it properly bring brought to to nothing of what they actually want and it, they they worsened sensibly the situation for themselves primarily. So you know my compliments. Um, but again, it's it's difficult not to see a sort of romanticism either in at least in the ideal right or at least in something that this people didn't believe strong enough in spite of the dramatic resistance on the battlefield and so on to succeed to convince the others which is actually actually the base of civilization all great military empires do not last because there is an oppressive terroristic regime that kills everybody if they want to break free uh, it's that there is properly a point of a co the, the benefit of the cooperation. Um, these experiments, instead, as all revolutions, are short, brutal um, failures in substantial worsteners of the living condition, properly of, of the average people, that are also the primary responsible for what happens. Because you cannot have any regime without the, without the decisive moral support of the people. Uh, not wealth, not technology, all this other con conspiracy theory bullshit. Right, that we are hearing today from paranoid ethno populist left and right wing uh, fanatics. Right, those are just, in fact, the lesser people of, of, of the culture, and that's why they behave like that. Um, the, um, th there was some, like I mentioned Nicholas of Hus because he, for example, negotiated on behalf of a crowd which had gathered to ask the king for the right of children to be given communion. So important trade union, again, between the, the establishment and the commoners, that in the sense were trusted, right? Surely there was some practical benefit that these individuals were seeking, even just aside from, from ideals. Um, there are all what, right? The miscalculation there can definitely happen. Speaking of the peasantry, in fact, that's the largest, of course, part of the population. There was an important difference within the 
the the crown lands um say that the more the western you, you went and generally speaking that the better it was um depending of course also for how wealth was distributed etc but there were important variations that that's what i mean also locally by the beginning of the 15th century most labor services had disappeared right this is the end of a of the very long process that had brought to the end of probably what we consider as slavery right and even served on by a degree in fact many peasants paid their rent in money right that was pretty much the normality in europe by by that at least in this western central europe speaking of the eastern really not but one of the main consequences of course was the fact that the peasants were freed to work their own lands and sell surpluses for profit as well and this partially benefited the the landowners as well um, generally speaking the wealthiest four to five percent of the peasants worked a good one fifth of one fourth of the entire land in the crown um, territories most peasants instead held modest sized holdings uh, at this point, following the broader late uh, medieval phase, there was not great hunger for land. The situation, economically, as we've seen, was not good. So people were just trying to survive, and actually it was much greater land available after the depopulation had occurred. It's just that labor force was, was weaker uh, in that sense. So this meant that most peasant families were somehow, yes, surviving even with some surplus but it politically they were again they, they were feeling the stress so that's also what the Hussite movement comes from because they were ever greater prey of the of the oligarchy in one or another um, we know for example in the late 14th century an entire village had gone deserted in the estate of Chinov near Tabor so the center also one of the single most radical Hussite um, sect and this I guess can be uh, an example of it of course those areas had gone underpopulated because of general consequences of misery rather than properly people dying but they had moved because you know they couldn't find a life there anymore um, and peasants were suffering every kind of abuses, mistreatment, humiliations. Especially they were uncertain about their future. Hence also why this kind of spiritual interest and motivation. Because um, when the entire establishment is in trouble, and as we've seen, you are essentially the last uh, step of, of the ladder downwards, and so everybody walks on you literally um, the let's say life is not easy life is not bright there are not great prospects and so you start hoping in some almost mis in fact messianic ideal that however you want to substantiate in a moral sense um, thus when this new dignity was promised they joined the Hussite call for a new church, a new world, and so on. Again, foolishly, as you understand, these were also the largely uneducated people. Yes, it's true that some peasants were literate and so on, and that the the late medieval commoner starts reading more frequently, starts especially hearing ideas. Um, this point, the reason the press already, but the expansion of the book market had already happened for it eventually to to appear so ideas traveled faster um, communities were somehow more aware of of, of of the world generally speaking again the peasants would lose quite concretely because they they didn't know even how let's say how common their condition really was 
even abroad and so on. They were, but it was normal because they were mostly attached to their own community. It's not that they gave a damn about other people practically. They were mostly searching for their own um, salvation. Uh, and it's obvious that such former servants and Qatars served with extremistic zeal, right, and brutal fanaticism, especially in the Taborite armies, right, fighting side by side with uh, bailiffs, stewards, even gentry, though. Uh, so somehow being confirmed in their own bias that they, they were seeing the establishment collapsing because these people after all were also uh, that had to embody the order had felt betrayed in a way uh, and and so on but when they were back in the village of course the results were were pretty meager if they were lucky in the first place and um, generally speaking peasants were dependents as we've seen the land belonged mostly to the nobility, to the church, they, the peasantry thus owned rents and obeisance to their lords. That had all a series of duties, right, to defend the community, and it was their interest because they worked for them, and so you don't want to rob our barons and other common uh, criminals to, to disrupt this order, but not even the peasants to actually join into those activities and wanting to subvert the natural order. It's paradoxically some kind of uh, local officials, so the ones that would also properly deal with the peasantry on, on behalf of the noblemen, because these this, um, offices were, especially in the most extensive estates, naturally subcontracted. This is typical right, of uh, land uh, management at the time. Would, beca would become some of the greatest uh, beneficiaries of the first of the revolution then especially the reestablishment of the order so again lots of good good uh, aristocrats were killed during the the revolution with again some newcomers who were just people of less um, you know moral and personal condition that however had enormously aggrandized their power exploiting this this, this thing and th they were the the middle ground uh, as we've already seen with other examples uh, and the the revolution also was evidently and immediately much less holy than the uh, peasantry had hoped for because lots of war were, were fought and guess what happened there were uh, de facto permanent armies, which also was definitely not the case in pre Hussite wars times, like it was the normality at the time, systematically living off the land. There are some beautiful old Czech annals describing, for example, how prices increased by the 60s of, of the 15th century, right, as a consequence of the disastrous Hussite enterprise. Um, and the normality during the, the war years had been the peasants having broken their back in the fields, preparing to harvest finally, well, soldiers coming and burning the crops, right? Not just stealing them, but probably devastating this scorched earth strategy that were carried out from one side and the other. The peasants beginning to plow, hoping not to starve, to death and soldiers coming and actively preventing them from doing so because they wanted to damage this or that community depending on which side that they really were. And at the same time, uh, the peasants were also asked, if not properly to join the army, but also to pay further uh, levies essentially uh, in the name of this cause. Right, so at the end of the day, that's how the country was destroyed and one-third of the population lost. And I'm making it very candid, not saying about, you know, people being scorched alive, uh, you know, raped and burned or things like this. But that would be the, the cute, fuzzy, you know, um, treatment you could get in this happy and, you know, 
virtuous uh, activities. Now, um, these cities also play a relevant role because the the crown of Bohemia, as we were saying before, had always owed much to the, the towns, mostly. Um, as you know, in Central Europe, there hadn't been properly a urban tradition, but towns had been developing importantly, given that Bohemia was well located, of course, in the center of Europe, some of the most important routes from west to east, north to south. It had this important minerary um, assets that the townspeople had somehow monopolized, um, the you know important autonomies tr through charters, etc. City rights had been provided by the the, the the, the monarchs to curb the power of the nobility. Um, so, again, there are several centers that de developed as it was normal at the time, as sort of, say, un un universes on their own, right? The burger mentality is exclusively the town, right? And in fact, the local patriciate would enjoy a somehow nobilier status within the city gate, right? And also throughout the country, meaning that the townspeople, of course, had, together with this important autonomy in self-government, also an important um, right of representation that was in part mitigated, of course, by the fact that the king that had recognized the same could reserve himself to intervene to appoint magistrates, uh, so to of course, in very importantly in, in the urban politics. But um, the these people were, again, mm, somehow privileged in their own way. Um, they enjoyed uh, most of their revenues from trade, industry. Also, the interest arising from debts and rents, the, the aforementioned peasant crisis had brought essentially many uh, many commoners to indebt themselves and essentially first of all being attracted towards the city but um, probably at some point having to accept the urban influence on, on them right and given that most of these people sold products that were uh, say marketed in, in within the towns and the town people used to, of course, buy the land in the countryside. The nobility saw this as a threat because it was not normal north of the Alps of having anything like the town, the city, managing to control the surrounding countryside. That, that's the prince's land, right? Uh, but also the 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 king was wary of this because the, the cities could play also their dirty game, especially in revolutionary times. Uh, and the wealthy elites of, of the town, of course, monopolized the, the council. They reserved important prerogatives for, for themselves. Uh, and they were, however, fueling an important degree of uh, art, uh, civil development, right? Uh, they patronized uh, Czech preachers. They mm, commissioned, I don't know, beautiful illuminated Bibles that we have from Bohemian this centuries in vernacular, right? So, so paying uh, people for translating, for, for habituating to this to the practice of, of the language, they could found hospitals, public baths, right, uh, helping the poor because in medieval cities it was normal just in the street to have lots of beggars. Of, you know, it's not like in the, in the modern age where the, all the emarginated are fundamentally secluded, either properly internated somewhere or, uh, especially in the industrial times, just you know living in the suburbs. So there was something, of course, like this um, in in the, the towns as well. Many people lived outside, just outside the city gates, and that at some point they had to build new walls to, to defend them. But say, 
especially this Central European reality is more compact, more, let's say, um, more modest too, right? But uh, still, this wealth is is perceived, right? There are beautiful works of art, uh, altar panels, etc., commissioned not just by nobility typically, but also um, but or the church, but also by these sort of bourgeoisie. And um, the re the reform in Bohemia owed much to these people as well. That, however, were also the more moderate to some degree, aside from, again, some cities like Tabor that becomes, you know, the single most viciously fanatic center of the entire Hussite movement and, in fact, ends pretty bloodily as was well deserved. But um, the, the townsmen are this new, by some degree also, not necessarily the intelligentsia per se, because we're going towards kind of a humanistic and thus elite kind of of, of cultural development. But they are important, again, dealers, let's put it in this way, as they were a bit, mostly they were mercantile uh, estates. Um, there were naturally many smaller centers, towns, smaller towns, if not villages. Mm -hmm. And so there, th the world was much more blurred with the uh, rural one, right? There may have not properly been, a, say, walls as we intend in a more complete sense. Uh, here, the economy was mostly based on agriculture and rents from their holdings. Th there was some important artisan manufacturing, also some trade, of course. Uh, and all the people involved in this business mostly um, earned their living by meeting the local, strictly local needs. So they were somehow very modest in reality. Uh, tariff records show a healthy local trade in goods ranging from grain and cattle. We were just talking about cattle breeding late medieval Europe, remembering Bohemia as having an important increase in this activity. In, uh, in fact, those, those very centuries, but also iron and pottery. Mm -hmm. Then, in, in all this world, of course, as we were hinting at before, there was um, probably an even lesser dimension. The one of, of the poor, the property less, um, who, given that they practically didn't own anything. They were also exempted from taxation and thus they didn't basically have any any practical right, right? They, they couldn't participate, for example, in public life mostly and as you understand even less in the in the politics, in the decisional process. They were not represented. Uh, and these were some also of the, the scam that was feeling the Hussite ranks at the most atrocious level because these would be the people that essentially don't give a damn or almost about any form of of spiritual issue. They just want to eat and steal and rob and kill in order to achieve that. And so uh, we find them pretty much everywhere in every time and every time. Fortunately, they're not really the majority, right? So, but um, they still exist to, to recall us what, what, you know, a beast-like lifestyle really looks like. Um, so we will see what also morally the broader pneuma of the Hussite movement really revolve around. Uh, that was based on apostolic lifestyle, uh, sometimes also just models of prayer. Also sexual purity was apparently important, generosity, that, that these things would, as mostly in this process, then movements would also escalate to something that, you know, especially once we stress more sexual purity, we're very often uh, engaging in some sort of more, you know, much more dissolute lifestyle. Think about the Adamites, or um, it was a sort of communistic lifestyle, so kind of hippie one uh, and uh, alternating that with some kind of extreme violence and etc. And some of them were in fact slaughtered famously enough by by the same Hussites that were shocked even by their practices. So of course uh, 
it's difficult to have a single interpretation on anything but these are the things that happen when you go too far uh, there was the broader issue that gets back in the history of Christianity to the the, the fitness of of the of the of the priesthood, which again has been patristically solved, but would reemerge importantly in the Reformation, as you know, also from the scripts of Saint uh, Saint Paul of Saint Aug Augustine that had. Uh, discuss importantly this aspect not uh, however not to the full satisfaction um, at least of the new means of a uh, 16th century at that point world was more complex and somehow had stronger forces agitating within it in a kind of in a narrower space let's put it in this way um, so what is relevant here I would say about the especially the beginning of the of the Hussite wars with the revolution breaking out in 1419 is the important political and military role played by the commoners in preventing King Sigismund from taking the throne and starting the entire thing. So this will be more evident in a video dedicated to the politics or the political background even just of the Hussite Wars, um, but the general background is the one we described socially to explain also what, what this world was really about, right? So compared to our own, of course, any medieval reality is dramatically miserable. And in some of these environments, of course, it was more miserable than, than other places where this revolutions fundamentally wouldn't happen. And as we were saying before, um, it's still uh, the imbalance existing that brought to further Im imbalance later. So this aspect is obviously always present, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's at the base of our political dichotomy. Yes, life is hard, so let's try to make it less hard if we make a collective effort. But the question is how much that effort is going to benefit us right and, and not habituating instead people to to rely on something that somebody else has to work to produce for them so it's basically the other way around it's a struggle it's a competition for prerogatives and 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 that's where also civilizational path takes place in the hope of say being able to ever more compensate the the losses but the gains, whatever the means though, right, can be also very brutal and very, in fact, uh, degenerative, especially if you see it in a, in a traditional sense, whereas, say, um, the, the problem is never modernity per se, it's, you know, how much you're not able to handle modernity. Uh, and that, in fact, would, uh, would be a, a huge point in these kind of kind of events, uh, especially in the host side movement. But again, I have a playlist about Bohemian history, host side history, warfare. Uh, so we will keep, I, I'm glad, always glad when I can talk about this topic specifically because I care to address carefully every single, especially medieval European reality, then hopefully extending further to at some point. Um, looking step by step again at, at all the different phases of certain given issues right so you can rely on me making multiple videos on these topics for different countries and we're just at the beginning right you know I, I will never live enough to, to say everything I want to say here so let's try it can be interesting to make it work this way um, for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye